Thank you everyone for attending and it's been enough for the Good day, everyone. I promise I'm not going to take time because the effort is fast spent. Um, I'm pretty glad to also hear from um, Professor Monsa Chung. Um, I happen to also apply to Vanderbilt University during my application for PhD. And I is also happy to see him and also hear from him. And this research is in progress at the department. You know, um, three weeks ago, I started to rethink about Gothic architecture. And um, I also presented uh, a TED talk and this school on Gothic architecture among the finalists. So, and when I discovered that letter in archives, that maybe to kind of rethink about Gothic architecture as for imperialism. I read through the, the lines of the bishops, uh, not only really in Eastern Nigeria, but across all across other parts of uh, Africa. So I kind of rethink what really happened in in, in many architectural designs in Africa. And um, specifically, my interest specifically is in Eastern Nigeria um, or nature, which is the first uh, Christian settlement area in Eastern Nigeria. And um, I grew up in uh, in Onitsha City. Onitsha City is an urban settlement area in present day Anambra State, and one of the colonial settlement areas in Nigeria. And at the age of eleven, I was enrolled into a high school, Dennis Moria Grammar School, Onitsha, the first grammar school in Ibolan. And the only thing we heard about the school was the European good aspects and let alone the imperialism aspect of the, the British missionaries. But as I was reading through the, the, the archives, the, there seems to be a historical silence on the contributions of Africans to some of these uh, structures that have been examined and exploring in the past two weeks. It's, it, I became constrained on what um, Chino Achebe tries to call about the balance of story. How can we balance historical discourse? And it's why I also struck me when, I, when we were talking before this morning on the idea of non academic history. How, how, can, how can I write history based on all those sources and also to integrate all of them? It also speaks well to my paper because this paper essentially is all about oral history. Um, because in the lines of the of the letter I read, it moved down to discuss about school. And when I was kind of having some Zoom interaction with some people in our nature, one thing that stuck out was why are you only interested in the church? What about the schools? And what about what Africans did to Africa? Um, Eluka said. So I was kind of constrained on why. He made this comment. Why we are not looking on why, why are we only really interested in what Europeans did without emphasizing on what Africans did? So it's on this premise that I want to discuss. We are Afri we are Africans contributors to colonial stigmatization. The general society in our nature proves 1892 to 1925. 1892 is, is um, significant. That's the year St. Monica's College Oboniki was established. And 1925, the school I went, St. Monica School, was also established. So, as we think through these contents, I'm not going to waste time as I promised. We're going to look at some of how this um, oral history played a role, and also to hear from you, from you on how we're going to integrate some of this and it's still sketchy just two weeks ago with this research. Just a little bit of clarification. I know all of us um, are very concerned with this, but just to um, clarify, um, that's the map of Africa, this is map of uh, Eastern Nigeria particularly, but currently in Southeast, I just kind of dropping all people that made up Eastern Nigeria for to give a context, but here, here alone is the present Southeastern part of Nigeria. And the only scope of our study is um, divided into six districts, which are nature, where my focus is, is a part. So this is map of which I'm centering my arguments and my discourse. 
particularly Simonic here in Obunike and um, DMGS on nature is here, uh, that one on nature. And um, uh, Oka College is above uh, inquiry and all that. So the end of slave trade, as we all know, in 1804, opened up the idea of expedition, of 1841 expedition, 1857 expedition, with the concept of uh, civilizing and Christianizing Africa. Samurai then now that with its team sailed through the interior parts of eastern Nigeria and stopped in a particular location on nature strategically because of the river Niger. It played a very important role in transporting them into all the interior parts of the Igbo land. But this particular location had no common education. So by the time that we are thinking towards personalization, as I was discussing on the detector of the but by 1890s, there, there seemed to be a shift that we shouldn't emphasize much on churches. Why not we begin to think about mm -hmm. construction of schools and colleges for us to teach these uh, um, Africans? So the, the, the main interest was for them to teach Africans to become, as we all know, the local people as interpreters and clerks, clerks and people, laborers, and something like that. So they began to construct St. Monica's College, St. Monica's College, 1892, that they the main interest of this construction was for them to train girls, and Monica is a girls' college, to train girls to become good and godly wives and advance education in terms of limited training colleges that people, girls who have to attend St. Monica's and St. Paul's College, and specifically those people who are channel departing from African cultural. Um, traditions to British and colonial missionary model. So both a little bit um, context about missionary education in Nigeria. I wrote down here that the original missionary education in Nigeria has been traced in the 16th century when the Portuguese seminary was established at Sao Tome of the Nigerian coast in 1571. It was from there that missionaries were sent to worry in Niger Delta, Nigeria, to teach the people of the Shekiri on how to read and write. However, missionary education in Africa had been hotly debated just like the arguments on the abolition of slave trade I mentioned before. The recent writers have argued that the main thrust of British educational policy in Africa was to civilize and Christianize the people. But the context of their subjects are being modeled in terms of what they think Africa should know. However, it was to be recorded that the, these schools that established from 1890s in a major province was majorly one of the economic motives of colonial missionaries who started by translating the English Bible into the local languages. In Nigeria specifically, for instance, as the missionaries such as S.A. Crowder and other worked on translating the English Bible to Yoruba language, or got it translated to Epic, and actually King Dennis was translated to Igbo language. Why Dr. Walter did his in Asa language? Some of these practices was channeled in terms of the, the, the pioneers of the school. And as we think through, this is DMGS, we are. Um, I'm going to speak specifically. That dream was to serve as a place where teachers and caskies were introduced specifically, and a place to teach British civilization, and also a place to change the name. But as we are going to read the, read the oral history from people that we have gathered them, they are especially the pioneer members of this school, to hear from them what really the change of name, the civilization, and how they were reproduced different from how they were and also how they were stigmatized, not, not necessarily by the Europeans as most uh, as the literature has already exposed us to, but how did Africa also contribute to stigmatizing their own self? And 
this opens up um, my discourse about oral history. As I'm gathering, this is just uh, two weeks old. I'm going to go to read through some of the things I have gathered from the pioneers of these um, these schools. The first person I introduced said, these pioneer students, just like my elder brother, we are pre related, ostracized, and physically stigmatized by their loved ones. And they believe that they were not able to uphold the African culture of free of, of farming and trade. They also attended St. Monica's College via either orphans or with salads. Yeah. The next person said, the first set of colonial boys in DMGs was heavily stigmatized and occasionally called out on your check in your chat. This simply means you are wearing a white clothes trained by a white man because of their sparkling white shorts and white shirts, which was different from African dress. Atoronyocha literally means white man's sheep. The students in DMG we are seen as followers of colonial missionaries without destination. The third person I interviewed said, there was never a time we, did, we didn't hide our clothes when going back from school because people always came out to look and laugh at us. Because they were being trained, they were going to colonial schools, the Africans saw them as they are lazy, they don't go to farm. Mm -hmm. So these people were somehow stigmatized, but they were only going to school just to portray the European culture. The, the fourth one said it was the societal stigma on the school boys and girls that motivated the British colonial missionaries to maximize the people's ignorance to indoctrinate the students further on the evil of their tradition by teaching them British tradition, which of course individual freedom and free and free will. The emphasis he was making is that the, the colonial missionaries maximized the opportunity of ignorance of those stigmatization to go back and begin to strategize on how to reflect them to see how freedom works and also how free will can be occurred. Now, I want I want for her to ask what are the what happened to these pioneers in this school? And I was fascinated to hear that these pioneers in these schools we mentioned, Oka Trading College, DMGS, and St. Monica, became the founding fathers of modern college history. They, 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 they became the bishops, lawyers, doctors, instituting European culture in those people who did not value education at first. Now, let's take a look at what Elochuku Amucha is saying. By the late 1940s and, and early 1950s, after the Second World War, the wind of change got a grip on those who did not go to school in our region, especially attending DMGs, because he also went to DMGs. Some of the DMGs graduates were sent to Cambridge to further their studies. Some were sent to Oka Training College to complete their pastoral training. Some were retained in days as teachers. As we, including me, Walk down old and new market road. Children and adults called us Omogate. Omogate in, in evil context means rich people. They are now rich because they weren't valued at first. But now the, the wind of change now made them to be seen as rich uh, people because they understood the CMS majorities meant well for the evil to indication. Now I had a focus discussion on. Where are those pioneers? Let's, let's see how these people now became the founding fathers or the people that now modernized culture. And I had a collection of uh, uh, NGD from that said, those set of colonial boys in CMS school at Oka Training College and the of Nature, upon creation from Standard 6, traveled to England on colonial missionary grants. They came back. They became the founding elites in Omicha and Nigeria. These include Kenneth O. Dickey, the first indigenous Bachelor Seller of English of Ipa, and Professor of African History, Edmond Ekumi, the first Omicha Chief Magistrate, CEO of the Sukin, a well-named Adventist, Alfred Bove, 
an educationist, Theophilus, a pharmacist, Daniel, custom officer, Dr. Walter, medical doctor, Eko Animalo, international physicist, Professor Ezi, the professor of mathematics, I find yourself on the of Nigeria, Soka. And the Manuel Ifadwila, the first Nigerian international high jumper at Omar World Gold Medals. So they, they began to look at some of those people that went to TNDs, those schools that were still at like, and how they now became the, the pioneer members of furniture development. And I was fascinated with what uh, someone said during my interview. He said, just as we are discriminated, we were taught. Mm -hmm. So his argument, as I, as I kind of visit this oral of history, is that the, the colonial missionaries, the family teachers, maximize the discrimination that happened in this country to influence something that we are, that we are on in all those um, schools. And just a connection of the, of the um, oral history. Subjects such as history and geography are mostly streamlined in these topics. Topics such as Landa Brothers and Copac discovered, I'm, I'm fascinated because um, we're talking about this in the morning uh, and it's proof. Discovered with Niger, we are overemphasized. I know Malo was saying this. This was an indication of cultural imperialism, mm. as the people living on the banks of the river in Omeja had been cultivating, betting, fishing, and swimming in the river Niger before the arrival of many go back. In the I never knew that Mongo Park never discovered River Niger until I came back from Cambridge. Topics taught in African history only picture Africans as primitive and have a barbaric culture and fetish religious belief system. We were asked to change our names because we are told that those people whom we are studying us are well said up in that. African students look like devil as they do us. But our difference is that we put on whites and we represent Jesus Christ. Topics of the geography included the tropical forest, savannah forest, yeah. temperature forest, Indian hot, hot forest, and how the white mine has affected the lives of inhabitants living in this area. So me, what I learned from African geography as I was taught was that the Paritus and the coin coins in South Africa were looking like apes until the Dutch explorers came to their rescue. Um, wow. This was also clear evidence of cultural imperialism, as the Paritus and coin coins were only living together, practicing a democratic system of government, planting and harvesting of crops, grinding of animals, extracting elephants, and were engaged in long distance trade with our neighbors before the arrival of Dutch in 1652. I got to learn about this when I traveled to Cambridge. In religious studies, the topics we are clued from the Bible and we are related to the Africans to jettison their belief system as we are being stoned as stigmatized by ourselves. The main thrust of CMS schools in teaching religious studies was to prepare their students in the way of Christ, who would redeem them from those who were studying them? Because those people who were stigmatized that have sinned against the Father, I will be redeemed through the blood of Jesus Christ. Here. Yeah. If one believes in Christ, one will be saved from going to Melfi, as we were taught in our assembly class, and we all believed. The Roman Catholic Church, which came to our nature, Few years after the CMS have constructed DNGs, specifically the Christ the King College CKC in 1939 and St. Charles College on the 1928, strictly gave our students the rosary or crucifix of Christ as a sign of repentance and report to fight African religious practices and never to go back to the African religious practice. Teachers brought to the classroom by teachers teaching us religious studies had angel michael as a white man with a sword killing the devil which was the black often without clothes having lamb like having lamb like horns 
and wonky like they, and the ruthless, tricky disposition, and a propaganda of sin and destroyer of sin. For us, we need to rise with our white shorts and our white shirts to fight against this black death. <laughs> and in poetry, essentially, you will have the chest spirit, <coughs> D.H. Uh, Lawrence and Shaw. In English grammar comprehension, we are only asked to write the explanation of Asia and Africa. And in France, in the angels, who are still able <laughs> to be called, said we are taught how to write in Latin and understand mm -hmm. Shakespearean English. This picture, this, this picture of art is also contrary to position because we are only drawing the rails in England without even drawing our own design. Right. Yeah. The argument I want to present here is that beyond the concept of European stigmatizing Africans, that Africa also played a role in stigmatizing themselves and also opened up to a very large extent, maybe as I hear from you people on how to go back and structure its oral, oral history, that Africa also kind of opened up a, a channel through which these colonial um, imperialists or missionaries were utilized. And I want to end by saying that the pioneer students in our mission, we are seen as pests, and local people often accuse them because of their uniforms and white man's name. So we are stoned and abused on the road for attempting the traditions of colonial bastards. Despite, despite these molestation and intimidation from society, against these schoolboys in colonial schools, they later became the founding professional bodies that transformed the societal norms and values of the people. Because when they came back, they began to teach what they learned, not teaching the African history, but also kind of rethinking the European content because they are now in part. So we turn that skill, these pioneer student boys who steal from Chinese societies at Cambridge College on the related to the advancement, the political advancement, and joint development of the modern legacy. Thank you.